Well, good evening. Glad you all are here. Thank you so much for coming. It's good to be back. I was uh, uh, gone Sunday evening, so I wasn't able to be in the prayer service, although I did get to watch the prayer service. I got to watch and, and to be a part of it through uh, um, our live stream. So I'm, I'm thankful for live stream. I'm thankful, thankful that we have this ability to be able to present this each week to all of you who uh, are not with us. Many of you are uh, unable to be with us, and so you catch this at a later time. Some of you catch it through our podcast. Some of you catch it uh, uh, through one of our live stream services, either YouTube or Facebook or off of our website. But I just want to thank all of you for coming. Those of you that are here in-house tonight, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you all heard the news or not, but the church is open. Just in case you haven't, those of you watching, the church is open been open for a long time, but for those of you that may have missed something, uh, you know, you are really welcome to come. We'd love to have you in service. Being in-house is much different than it is being at home, although it is a little more inconvenient. You don't get to actually come in your pajamas, but uh, but I guess you could if you if you really felt like you needed to. We'd let you come in your pajamas too, if that's what you want to do. Uh, if, that, if, it, if it helps you to get here, because we'd really love for you to be here, because being in the house of God being with the fellowship of the saints is much, much better than it is. And I can say that personally because I've done it on both sides. And uh, I like it better when we're all together. And I like, I like it because it is, a, it is a scriptural way of doing things. And I know that there's a, you know, there's a lot of churches out there that uh, thrive on the idea of having their pastor in one location, their church in another location, and they watch it on a screen and you know, they can do that, but I'm a little more personal than that. I like to have the personal touch, and I like to be a part of a church that's uh, personal with, with the people, so it makes it a lot, a lot more fun, and we get to do a lot more that way, so thank you for coming. Our, our kids' classes are in uh, full swing. We've got classes for all of our children, our teens, our young adults, and uh, we're, just, we're just delighted to be able to present uh, this time together. Our, uh, our Wednesday night program is, is, is abbreviated from what it usually is, and the abbreviated service will, will change as soon as school is out, but we wanted to give the, everybody the opportunity to kind of get uh, back to the swing of it, and, and, and so getting back here is uh, important, so we'll be changing as we go through the summer months. And then I want to also, I just want to uh, just inform you that this coming Sunday, we're starting a series. I, I we, we're in a, we, we've been in a series on spiritual authority, and I felt led of the Lord to kind of put that on hold uh, for a few weeks. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be in a series called The Return of the King. It, it, it comes off of our, our uh, Resurrection Sunday uh, service that we had, The Return of the King. And that topic has a twofold meaning. One, it, the idea of return, because we for the first time in a year, we actually had our resurrection service in-house. So that's uh, part of it, that, the return. But then also to understand the return of the king because uh, not only did, he, uh, did Jesus rise again, but he has also promised us that he's coming again. So the king is coming. And we need to be ready for the king to come. Amen? We need to get ready for the king's return. We need to prepare ourselves for the opportunity to meet the king in the air very, very soon. I believe that. We used to sing a song, and we still do every now and then. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. And I, I believe that that is exactly where we are. So uh, look forward to that series. I know it's going to be a, 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 an opportunity for all of you to uh, get to know more about the coming of the Lord. In fact, uh, the, the sermon uh, series begins with the topic of could Jesus return? Could Jesus return this year? Is it possible? Is there a possibility? Uh, and I, you know, I, I don't, I, we don't, just so to preface that, we're not setting dates or anything of that nature, so don't go around saying, oh, the pastor at Jubilee Worship Center said Jesus is coming this year. Um, although I will say this, he could come this year. And in fact, uh, contrary to many, I'm looking for him to come this year. I want him to come this year, and I hope that he does come this year. But uh, we're going to look at some. We're just going to look at some details 
uh, about though that, that aspect of the coming of the Lord and why we believe that we are close to the coming of the Lord, closer than most people think. And uh, it, it's not hard, especially in our day and time, uh, to look at the circumstances and situations to realize where we are and what is going on. And, and the topic of our discussion tonight, and we're going to be going into this again, I'm going to take you a little bit further into uh, this idea of the blueprint of Scripture because I want us to look again at the Scripture verse that we, that we looked at last week when we started off our discussion where we talked about the fact that we know that in Isaiah the Bible says, remember the former things of old, for I am the God. And there is no other. I am God. I, I like the way that this is, this is written because Isaiah says, uh, he, he, he reinforces this text in Isaiah 46. I am God. I am God. And he declares it and he speaks it to us from the end to the beginning. So we see it if we go to Genesis, Genesis is the ancients of old. And he says, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, and, and says that my counsel will stand and I will do as I please. Uh, I, am, I know God does what he pleases. I know God uh, does the things he desires to do. And tonight, what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just kind of go back and look at some of the things that we've talked about in the past, just to kind of reiterate some things and then kind of build on those things. And we're going to do that this evening. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And let's just give God thanks for what He has done and all that He's doing. And I'm going to ask you, if you will, to remember uh, Sister Audrey Reno in your prayers. Sister Audrey is, um, as you know, uh, she's dealing with some, some situations in her physical body. But we need God to heal her. And, and then I'd like for you to remember Brother uh, Ray Jimenez. Brother Ray Jimenez's mother passed away yesterday evening and would like to remember that family in prayer as they go through this time of grieving. So as we pray together, just remember them especially tonight. Let's go to the Lord. Father, thank you once again for the opportunity we have to be able to come together. Thank you, Lord, for this time of teaching. Thank you, Lord, for the time that we have in the Word. And thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to be in your presence and to be in your house. I know, Lord, that there is, there is coming a day, and we're, I, I believe we're living in that day, where many, Lord, will depart from the faith and, and many grow cold. And, and we're warned of that. And we, we're, we're seeing, Lord, even now, God, as here in Indiana where uh, the governor has lifted all the mandates and, and uh, things of that nature, and yet still even at that, many have chosen not to assemble themselves. And for, for various reasons and whatever it may be. And the danger, Lord, I see in that, and I know, Lord, your warning is, is that there's a danger of, of a coldness coming over the hearts of many, many falling away from the faith because of it. And I know, Lord, that we're living in that time. It's very obvious, it's clear, Lord, that we're living in this time where the hearts of men are growing cold and faint. And so, Father, I pray for an awakening to come. I pray, God, for a, a, a stirring again of the hearts of people. I pray, God, that you will awaken our lives, that we'll see this and recognize it, God. Many that watch us, Lord, on, on the Internet, and they're watching us through our live stream service or listening to us through our podcast. Father, I know that, uh, that there needs to be, Lord, an awakening of hearts, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will do just that. I believe, God, that it's not over yet. I believe that there's still hope. People, Lord God, still need salvation. I believe the Word of God is still powerful enough to change the hearts of people. And I believe, God, that you sent your Word to heal us. That's why, God, we stand tonight in the gap for Sister Audrey, because we believe, Lord, in the healing power that comes through your Word. And, God, that you, Lord, declared it to us that with your stripes we're made whole. And so, God, tonight I pray for her healing. I pray, God, for her, and not only her, but many others, Mary Fox. I, God, I pray, God, as we continue to pray for her, Lord, in the, uh, that she, Lord God, will be raised up, God, and, and will walk in, in, in newness of life and health, God. I pray, Lord, that, that many, Lord God, who have been dealing with illnesses in their bodies, God, that their, 
that they would walk, God, in the wholeness of your word so that, God, they can be healed. I pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit to come to those who are needing comforting right now. Lord, I pray for Brother Ray and his family. And I know, Lord, that uh, loss is, is one of those things, God, that uh, it, it really does grip us. And Father, I pray that you will touch him, touch his family. And Lord God, as they uh, celebrate the life of, of his mother and, and this one, Lord, that was loved so dearly, I pray, God, by the Holy Spirit, that you'll be with them and just strengthen them and lift them up. And God, I pray that you'll touch us as a church. God, let us be a, a, a go-and-tell church. Let us be a church that goes outside the walls. And, and Lord, that we'll not be ashamed of the gospel. We'll, we'll declare it, God, wherever we go, to whomever we talk to. Lord God, that we'll, we'll strike up conversation with people and friends and loved ones and those that we care about. And God, we'll listen, God, to what they say. And we'll, God, look for the opportunities of uh, doors opening so that we can speak truth, God, to them, the truth of your word. Father, I pray tonight that you will help us, Lord, as we listen to this study and we go through this time, Lord, for the next few moments, that we will, God, allow the word of the Lord to help us to see clearly where you want us to be and where we are, Lord, in the time frame of what you've declared. Because you said, God, that we can look back at the ancients and, God, we can look back, Lord, through the Old Testament word and the things, God, that we in the New Testament we can see, Lord, from there we can, we can get a, a gauge on where we are, Lord, as we look to your return. So, Father, I pray tonight that you will speak to us and speak through us. I pray, Holy Spirit, that the Word of God will penetrate the hearts. of Through our classes tonight, God, and the students, Lord, that are here, I pray, Lord God, that you will just touch them, the teachers, anoint them to speak words of life, God, we pray. And God, for all of this, we'll give you the glory and the honor, the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, as we, as we discussed uh, last, the last time we were together, we talked about the aspect of, of if you want to know, know what is happening in, in our nation, America, then one of the ways that you can, you can uh, see what's happening is to look at the nation of Israel. And I say that because of all the nations in the world, of all the nations in the world, Israel we know was, was the promised nation. God promised Abraham that the tribe of, of, of Abraham, those, uh, his descendants would be as uh, numerous as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. And so we know that that nation was appointed and anointed by God. We know that they were the chosen. Israel is chosen by God. They're the chosen people of God. But we also know based on our history as a nation, we know that of all the nations of the world, our nation, America, is founded on principles outlined by the Word of God and that our forefathers believed that the nation of America would be a city set on a hill. That it would be a light to the world. And truthfully, you know, it has been. If you look at the nation of America, no nation in the world has impacted the world any more than the nation of America in a positive way. Uh, the, it, you know, you, you figure that of all the nations of the world, America is one of the youngest nations of the world. It, it, is, a, it is a very young, our republic is very young in comparison to if you compare it to, say, um, the Middle East or China, places like that, uh, Russia, uh, the Germanic uh, tribe. We're, we're a very young nation in comparison to the rest of the world. And how can such a young nation have such an impact? How can we, how can we have turned into becoming a global power as we have? How, did we, how are we able to impact the economic situation of the rest of the world? How is it that America can be, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, able to have a military that is uh, second to no one? How does that happen? How do you, how do you go from this infant, you know, 13 little colonies, uh, how, did we, how did we literally defeat 
the strongest nation in the world when we uh, declared our independence. How was that possible? Uh, it shouldn't have happened. There is, there is, you know, the evidence would have been to the contrary. We should have continued to be under uh, British rule. Our, this nation should have been divided uh, between the Germans and the English. Uh, if you, you know, if, to, to be honest, when you look at it, because we were outnumbered, outgunned, everything. But God had a purpose for America. And I, I, I believe that. I believe that America is in existence today because the hand of God was upon it. And I know that, you know, a lot of people would, would, would you know, want to try to counter that. Uh, but, you know, you can't, it's really difficult to, to say that America was not founded on Christian principles. It's really hard to build a case for that when you go back into our history and just view the documents, view the thing, even our own, our own you know, constitution, that we have been uh, endowed by our Creator with unalienable rights, um, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That language in itself is language that shows us that, that this nation... You know, the, the founders of our nation believed that God, the Creator, was the ones who gave us the abilities to do what we are. And, 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 and then at the same time, uh, in our day and time, in, in the century that we're living in, in this time, we see that those unalienable rights are being attacked, uh, you know, on, on a day, almost on a daily basis. And, and, and if, you, if you want to know, if you really want to know where we're headed, then just keep an eye on Israel. If you really want to know what's going on, if you're, really, if you're really interested in knowing where the nation of America is going to head, just keep an eye on what's going on in Israel, and it's going to tell you a lot. And this is what I believe Isaiah was talking about. Part of what Isaiah was saying is that if you, if you want to know the, the really what's going on God's word reveals these things and a lot of the issues that I think that we deal with when it comes to trying to understand uh, the um, eschatology of the Bible the the things of the end times I think a lot of that is we, we complicate a lot of it I think we we, we, we try to look at the the, the scriptures from what I, what I view as a Western mindset, from an American point of view. And when you do that, when you view eschatology from a Western point of view, you're, you're slanting your viewpoints because you're basing it upon um, strictly the way that Western culture views things. And you have to realize that the Bible, you know, the, the document, the Bible, uh, those documents come not from the American side of things, not from the Western culture. It actually comes from the Middle Eastern culture. So to really understand, you know, eschatology, uh, you know, and, and, and in its fullness, I think you have to, you do have to get somewhat of a grip on the, what, the, the Middle Eastern culture and what goes on there and how they see things. And that's not that easy sometimes for us because we have a completely different mindset. Westerners see things differently than the rest of the world does. And, and I think we could all agree with that. I think, I think that's pretty obvious. We, we, view, we view God in a, in a really, a lot of times, in a lot different ways than, say, the Middle East uh, uh, culture does. They see, it, they see it differently. And a lot of that's because that is a very, that's the oldest culture. You look at, you, know, you go back, you know, as far as biblical times, the, the, the Middle Eastern culture is where the, or we call the Asian culture, is where you know the scriptures actually come out of. This is where it starts. So the you know where did the world begin? Where was you know the, the big question is uh, where is where is where was at where was Adam and Eve? Where's the Garden of Eden? Where where is that located at? And the Bible gives reference to a, a, a reference point, and and we know that it wasn't in the United States, right? We know that the Garden of Eden wasn't here because the rivers mentioned in the Bible they don't run in America. They run in the Middle East. So we know that that is, you know, all the cultures of man, and you go back, all the cultures of man all began in that, in that location. They all began there, and they spread out from there. We know this to be true 
Because again, why? The ancients tell us so. What's the ancients? We'll go back to Genesis. What does Genesis say? Genesis tells us that, that you know, uh, God called Abraham out of Ur and brought him out of there and told him he's going to be the father of the nations and God planted him. And then uh, we see that. But, but even before then, you go back before then from the creation story, we see where uh, Adam and Eve are created. We see where um, Cain and Abel and then Seth. And we, we look back and we can see these things and we notice that, that uh, when you look at the time frames of the time of Adam and Eve to the time of Noah, we know that uh, the hearts of men began to get wicked. And we know that God destroyed the earth with a great flood. And we know that uh, from, the, from Scripture. We know what the Bible says. Now, there's a lot of people that deny the Bible. I, you know, I, I, I know that. But just because you say it doesn't, it's not true doesn't make it not true. I think that that's one of the things that we have to realize. And we'll talk about it a little bit here in a moment. But you have to, you have to go back. So we know that, that when, when, when Noah came off of the ark, we know that you know, Ham, Shem, and Japheth were the sons of Noah. And we know that they, that they went to different parts of the world. They began to move. And we know that uh, the Tower of Babel was, was uh, 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 an event that happened in the Bible. We know that, that God saw that the hearts of men uh, were bent on doing what they were going to do, so God came down and he confused the languages. And we know that from there, uh, people of different languages began to gather together. And we know that that's where, you know, where the, the languages came from. And we know, you know the different dialects of languages began to form and things of that nature. And we know that, and then we know that, uh, you know, that we didn't even know America existed. We didn't know it existed. Um, some of the very first people that actually came over, they didn't even know what they found. Were they, they, they say the Northerners, the, the, uh, the, the Vikings came and actually came here, and they, but they didn't know what it was. They had no idea. They didn't know what it was, but there's, you know, there's supposedly archaeological findings that say that, you know, that, that there were Northerners or some people call them Vikings, came, you know, to, the, to, the, to this country at some point in time. But we also know that uh, Christopher Columbus and others, you know, when they traveled looking for a shorter route for the trade routes, they came through here and discovered these lands. And we know that uh, there were indigenous people on these lands. We know that. We know that they were there. How'd they get here? You know, there's a lot of questions like that. People, always, people are always trying to figure that out all those kinds of things. What I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to say is this, is that the Bible speaks to, a, to all of that. You can go into the Word of God and you can find all, it's all there. It, you know, uh, you can find, I mean, think about it this way. Before, before uh, Columbus, everybody thought the world was flat. In fact, there are people today that still believe the earth is flat. Uh, there's a, the, the Flat Earth Society, they, they do, they they believe it's flat, and there's people that are prominent uh, that, that uh, you know, believe the earth is flat. Um, but, you know, that means that they would fall off the earth. Basically, the idea was is that you go so far, and then you'd fall off. And, they, you know, the oceans, you know, things like that, that there was an ending. Um, but we, we, know, we, we, we know that the earth isn't. And a lot of people say, well, the Bible talks about the four corners uh, of the earth, and that's where they, at first they had the idea, well, maybe it was. But we also know that the earth is a sphere. It's not square. It's, 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 it's a sphere. And we know that. It's, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of things. Like that. And it's interesting because the men, the men of science, in the, in the early science, when, when, I, when I feel like that science was more, you know, there, there was a lot of legitimacy in science, was because of the fact that they used the Bible as their basis. They went to the Scriptures. They always they studied the Scriptures, and they looked at the Scriptures to, to make determinations, to find out things, to discover things. It was from Scripture. Because that, but, but we moved away from that. And we went into the time, of this, the time of reason, the Renaissance, time of reasoning where we decided that, you know, we, that man could reason his way through things. And, and, and from there, man begins to take over uh, and do the things that man does. And you know what happens when man gets a hold of something? He usually doesn't make it better. He usually ends up making it worse. And, and, and you know, that's basically kind of where we've been. And, and we look at the world, we look at the world, and, and I know we look at it one way, and you go to another part of the world, and they see the world differently because they see it from their point of view. And they look at it from, from their 
their their worldview. But what I what I want us to understand is is that it's not. I don't want us to look at the world as a an American worldview, and I don't want us to look at it. I, I don't want people to look at it from say a I'm, I'm from England, so from a uh, a British worldview or anything like that. I want to look at it from a biblical worldview. And I, I want the Bible to be the basis for what we teach and believe. That we hold to the Bible. And that that scripture, you know, is, you know, that's the basis, that's the foundation for everything for our life. If if we don't have scripture as our foundation then we have to question well what are we building our lives on what are we building what what do we what is our our worldview where do we get our world now we know that getting a worldview uh can come from a lot of things you know society influences us we know that we know that if you are in a certain society there are certain societal things that influence us but just because there's that doesn't mean that that has to be the absolute for us because we want the Bible to always be the foundation on which we build and we turn to. Everything we say and do should be based upon God's Word. You make decisions every day, am I right? Every day you make a, you, you'll make decisions. You'll make countless decisions. You know, from Some of them are, are menial to what color socks am I going to put on today? you know, to, to, to important decisions, you know, that, that, that could be literally life altering, right? You're, you're going to make decisions and you do this daily. But what do you base your decision process on? What influences your decision making? And I think that's important to, to, to kind of think about, don't you? I think it's important. I think it's important. When I make a decision, what do I base it on? If I'm going to go out and buy a new car, what do I base that decision on? Well, I can do all the research, right? I can go, I can get consumer magazines and I can read about all the different things about cars and find out all the things I don't need to know about. What's the best rated car? What gets the best gas mileage? Yada, 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 right? All of those kinds of things. I can do all that. But before I buy that car, do I ask God about it? Do I allow him to be a part of that equation? If I don't, then I probably am not really living my life based on a biblical worldview. Because some people and some people say, well, why should I bother God with that? Why shouldn't you? Should you not bother God with, with, with basic decisions of life? It's a very good question. I think it's a good question to ask. Should we ask God? You know, I know the Bible says, you know, give no thought of the morrow. What you should wear, what you should eat, what you should drink. Why? Your father knows that you have need of those things, right? He knows you have need of that. So he says, you're not to give thought of that. Don't give thought about those things. But he says, but what are you supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be setting treasures not on this earth, but where? And those of you in the crowd, you can answer. Yeah, in heaven, right? We, we look at, and this is, this is, as believers in Jesus Christ, we, we are to have a different view than the rest of the world does. We look at, we look at the world from heaven downward, not from the earth upward. We look at things from heaven's perspective. If we flip that and start looking at it from earth's perspective, we're, we're just like everybody else. We, we see the world, you know, we look at the world and say, well, the world's going to, you know, it's, it's, it's going down the tubes, it's, you know, or, or, oh, you know, man's going to figure it out, we're going to get it, you know, we're going to get it fixed and it's going to be great and, you know, but we have to see things differently and a lot of times, a lot of times the, uh, uh, the world itself, in, 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 a, in a general perspective, they're not very kind toward the church. They don't like the church. They don't like Christian people. 
And we, we, we thought, well, that, they really don't. Uh, part of the problem is, is because we see things different than the rest of the world does. We view the world from a biblical point of view, and that gets in the way of man's agenda. That gets in the way. It, it, it's, a, it's a problem for them. So, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, uh, just to give you an example of this, and it, which is it, it's just a relevant thing, and, and I don't, please don't take this except for the fact, I'm just using it as, a, as, a, as an example, um, the, the whole idea behind the vaccine. Uh, just to show you, my case in point is this, um, the government officials are really, really working hard to try to get all the church pastors to promote everybody getting, a, uh, getting this vaccine. And the problem with that is, though, they're meeting a lot of resistance because of it, okay? Because there's a lot of pastors who are saying, that is not my call. That is not, I'm not, I'm not going to, that's not my thing. I'm not going to stand up here and promote these kinds of things because one, uh, morally, I may have a moral, I may have a moral objection to it. I may have a biblical objection to it. So, but what they're trying, so the campaign, and I don't know if you guys have noticed this or not, but there's a, been a big campaign by the government to try to get the church to, to get, to influence people in making the decision to do something like that. Now, whether or not you do that or not, that's, that's neither here nor there. I'm not, I'm not, I, that doesn't have anything to do with it. It's the idea, though, that the world, see, and the problem that run, we run into is that when there's resistance, by the church. So what, is, what do they do? Well, just, just like they did and then still doing, right, even now, just within the last, last week, where they took and they literally surrounded a church with law enforcement and, and told the people, you will not enter into this building. Period. You're not coming in. And we would think, well, that would never happen. You know, that would never happen. And yet it, it, it's happening, and it's happening in 2021. That's not something that happened, you know, back in, you know, uh, Nazi Germany or something like that. It's happening right now. So, the, the, and the reason that that happens is because there are many within Christendom who have a biblical worldview, who see the world from the Bible's perspective, and they, they, you know, are saying, look, you know what the Bible says that the law of God supersedes the laws of man. And the laws of God are what we stand, we stand on the laws of God and the, and the word of God, and we're going to do what the word of God says, even if it means, as one pastor uh, happened to, they handcuffed him and took him to jail because he refused to not preach, refused to not have his church uh, assembled together. Uh, there has, these are the kind, and some people say, well, what difference does it make? Why don't you just go ahead and we can comply with it? And all these kinds of things. The, the point I'm trying to make is, is that as, a, as, a, as, as Christians, as tr true followers of Jesus Christ, you are going to have to make decisions. But you have to make your decision not based upon what science says or what your doctor has told you or what, uh, you know, anyone else has said, you've got to go back and find out, you know, with you and, and, and between you and the Word of God and the Holy Spirit speaking to your life, and you make your decision on that. Amen. You cannot, and, 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 and to say, well, I'm only doing it because of that, then you know what? If you're, if you're led by what men say, then you're going to be led by what men say all the time. It's going, to, it's, going to, it's going to take you down that road. But if you're led by what the Word of God says, you have to follow the Word of God. And that's and this is important to us because we know we know how that for instance we know what happened in Israel we know what happened when when those in power those in power made decisions for the people now we don't we don't have a king we don't have a dictator at least we're not supposed to have and i you know I, Forgive me, because it's, it's I, you know, I, 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 I don't want to, because I've been accused so much of being political about things, and I, and I really, honestly, I don't want to be political here. I just want to be, I want to be biblical, not political. 
and I know that in the Word of God, I know what, the, I know what those in power did. I know that, that uh, Rehoboam, when, when the nation was divided, that he put a heavier yoke on the people than his father had, Solomon had. And I know that uh, Jeroboam in the northern kingdom created an easier way to worship God. Made it easy for people. Let's look at it. Let's, let's do it easy. And, and I, I got to tell you, you know, and again, you know, when I, when I see what's happening in our, in our nation, I see what's happening, especially within church world, one of the dangers there is, especially now, more now than ever, is the idea of, of, of taking the easy way out. What's wrong with tipping our hat to Caesar? What's wrong with, what's wrong with you know, tipping our hat to the idol? What's wrong with you know, just bow down? You know, that way you don't have to worry about going through any suffering. Just, just do it. You, you can do it on the outside, but you don't really mean it on the inside. Well, you know as well as I do, actions speak louder than words. Amen. The actions of our life speak more than what our words say. In fact, we can say something with our mouth, but if we're doing opposite of that, then what, what really speaks? It's the action. It's not the words we said. We nullify the words we say by the actions that we, that we do. So, you know, and, this, and we know this because we saw this in the Bible. We saw this in Daniel. When you read the book of Daniel, we saw this. When, when uh, uh, the, the Daniel and the, and the three Hebrews uh, uh, sons who, who were brought in, the young men that were brought in, when they were told to bow in front of, you know, at, at, when the music sounds, when all these, and, I, 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 and that's one of, I don't know if you really paid attention to that story or not or really looked at that, but I find it interesting that they played worship music, right? They played worship music to the idol. That's what they were doing. They were playing songs of celebration to the idol, and they said, now, when you hear it, you, everybody bow down, and everybody bows, and you make your acknowledgement. And, and the idea here is, you know, out of all the people that were taken into captivity, and there were many, there were not just four, there were many, everybody bowed down but, four, but those four, but well, we, we know of three, because Daniel's the one writing the story, he's writing it. We know the three who had their names changed from who they really were to who what, what the Babylonians wanted them to be, tried to change who they were. And by changing them that way, they thought, well, then we'll change them the rest. And the way to change, you keep programming them and programming them until they finally submit to what you want. That really sounds familiar to me. See, you say it over and over again. You keep doing it and do it and do it. And, if you, then, and then if you don't do it, eventually, then if you don't comply, well, we're going to just up the ante. We're going to say, well, if you don't do it, then this is what's going to happen to you. And we're, we're, we're seeing this now, right? Remember, the ancients tell us things about what's going on now. So we can look back and we can say, well, okay, we can see, the, we can see a lot of similarities to what was happening with Nebuchadnezzar and, and the Hebrews then, as we're seeing now. And we may not be in captivity, we may not be slaves. It would be worse for slaves. They were slaves. But they wanted, they wanted them for their own purposes. They wanted them. They wanted these intelligent men. They wanted these men. They wanted to use these men to counteract the God of the Hebrews. Their objective was is to get these, these individuals like Daniel and so on to begin to be more like them so that they could go off and they could influence the rest of the Hebrews and the rest of Israel. That's what they wanted. Well, why can't you just be like Shadrach? Why can't you just be like Meshach? And why can't you be like Abednego? Which that was not their Hebrew name, that was their Babylonian names. And that's what they wanted. They want, and what the world wants is they want us to comply with the world so that we can go around as the church and say, why don't you just go ahead and do what everybody else is doing? It's going to be all right. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we are not going to do that. We are, not going to, we are not going to bow. We're not going to bend. We're not going to do it. And this is the resolve that they had in their mind. 
and in their own hearts. <laughs> they were never disrespectful to the king. They said, oh, king, you can read it. it they, they never disrespected the one in authority. They never did that. They never looked at him and said, you know, you're, you're a worthless, you know, you're a, 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 you're, you're a you know, horrible leader and, you know, God's going to judge you. And No, they didn't. They said, oh, king, just let, oh, we want to let you know. We're just going to tell you right up front. Because they, all he said, he said, look, fellas, I'm going to give you another chance. If you just bow down, that's all I'm asking you to do. Just do it like everybody else does it. Because we can't have... We can't have you standing out against what we're doing. We want everybody. Everybody else is doing it. You ought to do it too. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. In fact, they said, he said, well, if you don't do it, then you know you're going to die. And their answer was, King, listen, we want you to understand something. The God that we serve, if he chooses for us to die in the furnace, then die in the furnace we will. But the God that we serve, He is able to keep us, and if He keeps us, He will keep us from the fiery furnace. But it doesn't make any, either way it goes, it doesn't matter. We are not going to do what you want us to do. We're not going to comply. We're just not going to do it. Of course, that enraged the leadership. And what did they do? Turned it up seven times. And I thought, wow. There's, there's something about... Numbers in the Bible mean things, right? Numbers in the Bible mean things. Seven. Seven is what? Complete. So in other words, this is going to be, we're going to eradicate you. We're going to completely eradicate you. You are no longer, you know, I hope it was worth it to you because we're turning it up seven times. It was so hot that literally when they opened the furnace up, it literally consumed the people that opened it up. It consumed them. That's how hot it was. And they put them, now, now I know that a lot of people probably think, well, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were so holy and so righteous that they weren't scared, they didn't, you know, they didn't tremble, they just kind of just walked in just nonchalantly and just said, oh, okay, this is fun, we'll do this and we'll dance in the fire. They were human beings, folks. All right? Now, I don't know what was going through their mind, I don't know what, but I know this, I know they had already made up their mind that it would be better for us to die for the cause that we believe in than it would be for us to bow like everybody else. And so the line in the sand, is, it was drawn, and, it, and it, of course it ended up, and the Bible said that they were, they, were, they were taken and they were cast into the furnace, and the door was closed. And the king, the Bible said the king peered in to look to see, and I don't know whether it was from above or from a doorway, however, but he looked to see, and he, and he asked the question, he said, didn't we throw three men into the fire? And they said, yes. And this is what interests me. This is one of the things that interests me. He said, well, how is it that, we, that there are four in the fire? And then he, then he makes a statement, and the fourth one is like the Son of God. Now, how did a pagan king know what the Son of God looked like? Do you ever think about that? When they brought them out, they were no longer bound. Their clothes smelled did not smell of smoke, their hair was not singed, there was no harm done to them. And that example to me is, 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 is just one of many examples that the ancients tell us, that those of old tell us, the prophets of old told us, the Word of God reveals to us of the importance it is because, because when we watch Israel, we watch them as they denigrate themselves, as they degrade as they move themselves down. And this is the reason why that that event happened was because of what Jeho uh, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, what happened because of the dividing of the kingdom. And because of the ease of what took place in the northern kingdom. 
Because what happened in the northern kingdom is that they, they, they reverted to idolatry. They reverted to idolatry. And this, is, this to me is, is really, I, I, idol worship literally became the common practice of the northern kingdom. Now it was practiced in the southern kingdom too, don't get me wrong. But not to the extent that it was in the northern kingdom. And this is what, what I, I believe that part of the reason for that is because when Jeroboam made the decision to create altars in places like Dan and uh, Samaria and places like that where they put up erected altars, they erected these altars to convince the people that it was not necessary for them to go to Jerusalem because it would be too inconvenient for them. And because he did not want to lose the people to the southern kingdom. He didn't want, he was afraid that he would lose his kingdom. Well, he's going to lose his kingdom anyways because it was always pro- already prophesied he would lose his kingdom. It's already, in fact, he already knew the, the prophecy was already given that he was going to lose it. But they, they reverted to idolatry and and, and what's interesting about this is, is that when you think about how that in the beginning the idol worship was something that not many people were bold about. They were not like outward about it. It was very private. Most of the idols were kept in homes. Most of the idols were kept hidden away. And, 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 and it wasn't until Jeroboam erected these altars and put this golden calf out where it could be seen, that people then began to bring their idols out. And now what happened is the invisible things become visible. The intangible things become tangible. And it wouldn't be long until this nation would fall into other things that idolatry leads to, that is, materialism, carnality, sensuality, and so on. The people had created their own gods. So what they did is they created gods of their own devices. Does that sound familiar? I'm sure you've you've probably heard, you know, the the way that this goes. Um, People start creating their own gods. Before long, they no longer really believe in, in the absolute truth of God's word, what God had told them, that you shall have no other God before me. That was one of the commands that they were to follow. They knew that. It wasn't, it wasn't an unknown uh, law. They knew the law of Moses. They knew what it said. Uh, Jeroboam knew the law. He knew what it said. But it didn't matter to him because he did this for his own doing. And he led others astray. In fact, he led the entire nation, ten tribes astray, to begin to uh, be subjected to this visible idol. And these then and you read in the scripture where they, they would erect uh, they would erect Asherah poles. They would erect them in high places. They would put them out in the fields. They would do this to because they were they were and what was going on is the influence of of the nations that surrounded them. The influence of these idol gods began to influence the nation of Israel. And their idea they they were looking at it well. They believed that God, God Jehovah was the God of the nation, but they didn't believe that God was a personal God of their hometown or of their home or even of their life. But he was the God, so they viewed God that way. So creating idols, moving away from what was absolute, now things become more subjective. And and this idea of subjective truth where uh you know, people uh, make you know claims of truth based upon their personal opinions or based upon their experiences, rather than basing it upon the facts. And this is 
this is, uh, again, where have we seen this? We see this now. This is exactly where we are. This idea of, uh, of, of subjective truth where uh, people hold to beliefs uh, because of an emotional connection they have. And uh, it has little uh, bearing or little attachment to the reality, to what's really true. It's simply because I, I feel that I am this or I feel emotionally connected to that. But anyone with a rational mind knows that isn't true. You know, so you have Bruce Jenner, a male who has convinced himself subjectively by his emotion that he is a female. So what does he do? Well, he grows his hair out long and he wears dresses and he starts going through augmentations and all these different things to try to make himself to be a female because emotionally he feels like that's what he is. But it's not based on truth because no matter how many augmentations he makes his DNA will always say that he's a man. So it doesn't matter whether the truth claim is based, you know, when it's based on a personal opinion or an experience, you know, this is, you know, we see, you know, these things, you know, it's like, uh, you know, Meghan Markle, you know, talking about how, you know, how abused her life is and how, you know, she's, you know, under this, you know, um, you know, she's been subjected to so much, you know, stuff. And here she is, she's a duchess lives in million dollar homes but you know but she's you know she's under attack and and she and it's like and people are sitting there and saying oh you know that's so sad so sad what is wrong with us sad but it's it's this, this idea of She's a victim. She's a victim of the, of the society that, because they're emotionally connected, they want to get emotion. They, they're looking for some way of, of having some emotion, something emotional is going on in their life. And so they, they placate these things out like this and they lay it out and everybody's sitting back looking like, and you got some people saying, yeah, you know, that's her truth. That's her truth. That's, that's really her truth. And, and, and then rational people are looking at her like, are you nuts? Is there something wrong with you? you? You must be mentally unstable or something because you, you're married to a, a prince. Uh, you travel you know, in motorcades. You have bodyguards. You make a million dollars a year doing nothing, but you're a victim. This is subjective truths. When people try to reason based upon emotion, they try to build their, their, their ideology based upon feelings. Things appear true to them based upon their emotional connection to it. The reason people you know, give you know, for holding on to subjective truths, you know, because things appear to be true only at, you know, sometimes, and they're not at others. So someone like, you know, the, the Duchess of, uh, you know, uh, uh, she can say, you know, when she's over here, you know, being interviewed by Oprah Winfrey, she can say how much of a victim she is, but then when she decides that she wants to be you know, all Hollywood and everything, she gets to have the red carpet thrown out. And that's okay. It's no different than a person who talks about how important it is, you know, that everybody, you know, do away with fossil fuels, but then they fly around in a jet everywhere they go. Subjective truth is never based upon truth. 
It's only based upon what they feel is important at the time. And, and, this, and this is the same, this is exactly what was going on in Israel. See? The same kind of things that they were doing are the same kind of things that we see happening right now in the world. The world itself looks at this, and many, many who have, in fact, honestly, people with, with rational thinking oftentimes start questioning or not whether they're rational in their own thinking or not. You start wondering, maybe there's something to this. And there's not. You know, when people, you know, like I said, there was a time when people believed the earth is flat. There's still people that believe it. But just because they believe it doesn't make it true. We know the world is not flat. And see, this is one of the pro problems we run into because when you talk about, you know, relative or subjective truth, um, you know, those who believe in like relativism, things are relative, which is a part of subjective truth, they believe that subjective truth is true to everyone, uh, it, it is, is true for everyone, not just for them. They want you to accept their truth. They believe that it's important for you to accept them. And if you speak out against them, as one news commentator did, then you get fired from your job. So if you as a Christian speak out against something that they want to be true, and you as a believer say, wait a minute, the Bible says this, well, then you become, you're no longer, it's not, it's not a matter of you being a Christian. Now, now you are, you are, one, you are a hater. See? You're, you're, and they got all kinds of names for you. Because you, you believe what the Bible says, not what there's, a, just because they want. So, so if, you, if you're in a, in a place where, you know, you speak as a pastor, you speak out against same-sex marriage because the Bible teaches against it, and then, and, and, and then you have someone in your congregation who, who's there who believes in same-sex marriage. They call you a homophobe. And now, and now we have laws being written based upon the idea that there has to be equi equ equitability. Everybody needs, there has to be equity instead of equality. That's the same thing that was going on in Israel. It happened in Northern Kingdom. This is the kind of stuff that they were dealing with. Here's the king. He is living in palatial palaces. He's enjoying the good life. And he's taking everything from every, down, in, down, down in the Southern Kingdom. Uh, you know, Jeho Jer Jeroboam is subjecting the people to harsh treatment taking more and more money away from them, more and more of their funds away from them, while he's sitting there living in luxury and everybody's starving around them. This is the contradiction that, we're, that we saw, we see in the Bible. We see this where, and, 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 and what happens to us is, is if we're not careful, if we, don't, if we don't understand the absolute truth, okay, an absolute truth, and let me just, I'll define it like this. Absolute truth is something that is true all the time in all places. It's always true. It's always true. It's something that no matter what the circumstance, it is a fact that cannot be changed. Have you ever seen a square circle? Have you ever seen a square circle? Anybody? No. Why? Because there's no such thing as a square circle. You can't have a square circle. That's absolute. You either have a circle or you have a square, but you cannot have. Now, you can force a square peg into a circle, hole, right? But that doesn't make it a circle. It's still a square. The idea here is, is that you have to understand absolute truth. And this is, folks, and I know I'm out of time, but this is something that, that, the, that becomes an issue 
to the world we live in because the church, the true followers of Christ, and I make a distinction there because there are some in the church that are not true followers. Amen. And they're in, they're in the church, but Christ is not in them. But if you're a true Christ follower, you believe in absolute truth. You have to. Because the Word of God is absolutely true. And it's true in every situation. And it's true no matter where you're at. And it's true no matter what the circumstances are. It remains true. It remains unchanged. He says, I am God. And what? I change not. That's absolute. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's absolute. That's absolute. And nothing can change that. Nothing can change that. And it's not relative to a situation or relative to a circumstance. It's absolute. And that's something that we have to hold on to. Because if we don't, if we don't, and if we give in to the subjective truth, then we are no, we are, we are no less guilty than those who bowed in front of an idol and tipped their hat just so they could avoid being persecuted. Amen. And this is, I, and I really, I'm, I'm, I, you know, and I know this is this is a this is not one of those this is not one of those simple things. This is a hard, this is a hard word. I know it is. I, I know it is, and I know, and I, and I, and oftentimes, you know, as a pastor, it's like, man, I, I wish I could just, you know, I could, I could talk about the feel-good stuff, because there's a lot of that out there, and I like to talk about stuff like that, but I, I, I feel like sometimes I do a grave injustice if I, if I spend all my time talking about love, never talking about judgment, or if I spend all my time talking about judgment, never talk about love, I've got to find a balance, and I believe that it's important to talk about the love of God but also the justice of God and to understand that they're both equal parts and they both are important and the only way to know both of them is to know the absolute truth of the, the word of God to have it in your heart the psalmist said thy word have I hid in my heart that I would not sin so father as we close tonight may we may I always remain centered on the absolute truth of your word. Not to bow, not to bend, not to give in, not to placate my situation, not to circumvent your authority, not to assert my emotions and my feelings above what your word declares. But Lord, even when I'm uncomfortable with the word, I still want the Word to penetrate my heart. Even when I know it's going to cut me deep, I want it to cut me deep because, God, I want to live righteous and holy before You. I am more concerned, God, about what You think of me than I am what the world thinks of me. And Lord, forgive us. Forgive us if we've ever allowed the influence of this world to override the truth of your word in our lives. And I just ask you today, God, let it become strong in the hearts of your people. So they will walk up right before you, God. We have nothing to be ashamed of. And we have nothing to be afraid of. The enemy has no hold on those who walk in your truth. The world they cannot hold us because we are not of this world. Therefore, because we are kingdom-minded people, 
Let us walk, God, with the kingdom authority that you've given us. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for giving me the extra time tonight. May the Lord bless you, keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, give you peace. May this week be the greatest week of your life. Tell somebody about Jesus. They want to know about him. I believe you've got the answer for what they're looking for. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you this coming weekend. God bless.